Before you decide how to set up your business in terms of incorporating on the one hand or being a sole proprietor on the other hand, get the best lawyer and the best accountant that you can find. Get their advice about what your options are, what the advantages and the disadvantages are. There are tax ramifications, obviously. There are differences in what you can write off as legitimate business expenses. There are retirement fund differences in how you set up. I started out as an S-Corp. I switched to being a limited partnership. Uh, I've had other kinds of corporations. At the moment, I'm a sole proprietor. If you work out of your house, yes, there could be tax benefits to writing off a home office, but there are also very strict regulations for, for how to do that. Sometimes it's a matter of perception. For example, a large urban community where your market is, is sophisticated downtown people, you might have to have an office downtown just to prove that you're a real business. One way to handle the office situation is to rent an executive office suite, which are available in many communities at a very low rate. Another option, frankly, is to look at colleagues who have other kinds of businesses, who particularly in this economy may have more office space than they need and can afford. This relates as well to how you yourself appear, what you wear, how you behave when you meet with clients, but remembering that that may differ depending on where you are. In some cultures, it's a matter of respect. For example, I just got back from Jakarta where I was meeting with members of the Indonesian parliament. That's a culture where having your arms covered is, is a sign of respect. It's simply a costume where we are both comfortable with each other and recognize each other as professionals. Certainly, if you're going to be driving clients around, in addition to yourself spending a lot of time on the road, you want something that is comfortable, fairly new, safe, large enough, and make a choice that that is affordable if you can't buy it, lease it. Let's talk about the initial consultation. You talk through what you do, they talk about what they want, their dreams of how this wedding would go, certainly their financial constraints, what they want to spend. Make enough suggestions so that you're piquing their interest and you've demonstrated that, that you're creative and you're going to do wonderful things for them. I think sometimes our, our tendency in doing this is to spend a lot of time with, with hot air selling the services, they've already decided whether you're a possibility or not. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what it costs. I would be delighted to work with you. This is going to be a wonderful wedding. Later on, that's when your, your audience is going to expand and other members of the family and the wedding party may get involved in the wedding process. But the broader you expand this group, the more trouble you get into at the beginning. I think there are a lot of analogies between political campaigns and weddings, believe it or not. Both of these businesses are businesses where everyone thinks, well, I could do that. I know exactly how to do it. That then expands when there are power struggles with other members of the wedding party. It's your job to find a way to minimize their disruption and not to let them ruin the bride and groom's beautiful wedding. When we talk about same-sex weddings, sometimes there can be different kinds of situations that you might not have expected. Talk with two or three members of the wedding party about listening and going out of their way to make people feel comfortable. I think that one of the, the great parts, but also one of the most difficult parts of being a wedding planner is that you do need to be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a mental health counselor. Uh, you have so many hats to wear. If you live in a community where there are pockets of populations 
where lavish weddings, big wedding celebrations are popular. Look at doing something for all of them so that your reputation grows and your business is built on being a multicultural wedding planning business. What better if you're not Hispanic than to find an Hispanic partner and, and to build a business that is then truly multicultural. As we become increasingly connected with the rest of the world and as the diversity of, of the U.S. grows, there are going to be so many more opportunities for different kinds of weddings. I think that that will expand your business exponentially and also it's one of the tremendous personal benefits that you can gain from going into the wedding planning business. Wendy, you are wonderful. So oh, you're so sweet. You're and you just so got here. Awesome. Oh, so. no, you know, I wonderful. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you. Because I've been in like, you're so sweet. Oh, I'm with lots of gorgeous. Oh, 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 you're so sweet. Thank you so much.